let's turn to uh, Valley. Valley, give us your um, perspective on uh, current recommendations for EGFR testing. So the standard of care is to test all of our patients with adenocarcinoma, irrespective of clinical characteristics, with the approved assay. Um, but increasingly, at academic settings, we use NGS, as Alex mentioned. Um, the two sensitizing, the most common sensi sensitizing mutations are exo 19 deletion and L858R. But increasingly, with uh, next-generation sequencing, we're testing for also rare mutations of uh, EGFR, including um, exon 20 um, insertions. And we're also testing for the T790M. Now, the standard of care would be to test all patients with the available standard of care COBAS test. At progression from first-generation EGFR DKI, I cannot emphasize um, enough the need for a rebiopsy or plasma testing for the T790M detection, which of course will offer the patient the opportunity to receive the new standard of care and the best therapy of simertinib in this setting. So uh, I see increasing adoption of plasma testing. Um, the real recommendation should be plasma testing for patients whose tumor is not accessible for a biopsy when the testing is not feasible through a rebiopsy, but also for cases where the patients may object to a biopsy. The sensitivity and specificity of the plasma testing depends on the assay that is used, and it ranges between 51 to 75% at the current um, rates that we have seen with various assays. So for the plasma, we can also use the COBAS assay that is approved for uh, osimertinib, but we can also use NGS and other assays. You, you touched on this point a bit, um, and uh, I've emphasized this a lot to our community colleagues that, um, you know, there's quite a heterogeneous group of patients when you say EGFR mutations. Now, the two dominant ones, the exon 19 deletion and uh, L858R, we're, we're lucky they comprise, you know, 85 plus percent or so of those patients. But if you don't have one of those mutations, it's kind of a mix of sensitivity versus resistance. You, you mentioned exon 20 insertion deletion, which we really don't have a good strategy for. So if, if they're falling outside of the, the two dominant mutations, really there's lots of details in the fine print that they need to be aware of. That is correct. There are investigational approaches right. to address some of these um, rare mutations, but it is important that the practicing physician recognizes the significance of the mutation that they have detected in the tumor and doesn't write a blind check for all the patients because we have data suggesting that exon 20 insertions would not be responsive to first generation EGFR DKIs. And if you don't have any access to investigational therapy, these patients may be better served by standard of care no, I think, yeah, that should be emphasized because I've seen a few patients in my practice with exon 20 insertions that, that have been treated with a TKI and obviously have not benefited from, from right. that in many opinions. Um, Tracy, let's turn to the issue of, um, you know, we, we all in academic medicine versus community-based practitioners, Get, getting your thoughts on, you know, what do you see from the patients you see in the community in terms of testing patterns, what your thoughts are in terms of should there be differences between um, the list of potentially actionable things that are looked at at academic centers versus community colleagues? Mm -hmm. So when patients have come to see me from the community, um, what they have in the works often depends on whether or not they've seen a medical oncologist. Um, a lot of places don't have reflex testing, meaning when they diagnose a new case of lung cancer, they don't automatically send it, even for the NCCN guideline recommended testing, which is EGFR and ALK, and those are category one recommendations, and then strong consideration for ROS1. So oftentimes there's no testing that's been started. When I do see testing that's been done, I frequently only see the hotspot EGFR mutations, the exon 21 and 19, and ALK. And that really misses the EGFR rare mutations, misses 20, insertion 20 that we don't have a good approach for, but it also misses the exon 18 where there's data that a fatinib can be beneficial for those patients. And then it misses all the other ones Alex mentioned that we do have treatments for, the BRAF and, and, the, and the MET. Um, 
The other problem of starting the tissue testing on the outside is it uses up some of the specimen and you need enough material to get the next gen sequencing done. So oftentimes if they've had it, the testing started on the outside and they've taken the sequential approach, you won't have enough for the more broad-based molecular testing when they get to you. Um, that's one place I found the molecular testing really useful. Um, the logistics of this testing is difficult. The turnaround time is difficult. The College of American Pathologists actually recommends that the turnaround time be 14 days from the receipt in a molecular lab. We struggle meeting that ourselves at Penn. Um, but then when you need to get the material from an outside site to our site, that adds time. And it's not just the sick patients who I agree should start on chemotherapy. Patients psychologically are tormented by having to wait to start their therapy. So when I see a patient and I may not know the status of their molecular testing because they're trying to track it down from an outside laboratory or I'm worried about how long that turnaround time is going to take, that's where I sometimes send the plasma-based testing because I'm guaranteed to get a result in two weeks. The sensitivity is not good enough to rely only on that, but if I find an actual mutation, I can be pretty confident that that's something I can treat the patient for. You know, it's a great point. How, how, I want to hear from the panel. Just how often is tissue the issue, inadequacy of tissue? So in that paper I mentioned earlier where we looked at the sort of piecemeal testing versus doing next generation sequencing, there was a significant difference in biopsy load in patients where you did individual tests, where you had to go back in and get another biopsy, um, whereas if you just use the initial block to do more comprehensive testing, you might have gotten everything in. Um, so it, it's something that's often an issue. Yeah, yeah, and it's not insignificant. I hear a lot, and, and, and I think, um, where there may be less well-defined thoracic oncology programs, I hear a lot from community doctors that, you know, some of the initial procedures that are done may not yield adequate, for instance, you know, bronch with a wash. You get a diagnosis, but you don't get adequate tissue for these sorts of things. Plasma may help, mm -hmm. but, you know, um, you never know in that particular right. setting. Uh, so I think the, the, the message is, is that community oncologists need to be talking to their pulmonologists, interventional radiologists, surgeons to make sure that they understand it's a different time in, 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 in lung cancer. Um, so I think that, that's important. Uh, Jared, any comments on, on that? Just that in the real world, I think there is a very high rate of non-testing. Um, uh, it is absolutely mandatory to get EGFR and ALEC, in my opinion, ROS1. And I agree very strongly that um, when there are logistic barriers to this, that liquid can help a lot. Technique can also help a lot um, in communication early. So for example, not refacing the block uh, repeatedly, not doing too many IHCs. And even in the community, tumor boards can be very helpful to promote that communication between uh, oncologists and pathologists. I mean, I think the mentality that we all have to have, have oncologists is as uh, follows. I've been saying this for years. There is not a woman with breast cancer in the United States that would see a medical oncologist without ERPR and HER2 status determine on her diagnostic material. There should not be an adenocarcinoma patient of the lung that doesn't have some level of comprehensive testing because this is such a heterogeneous disease from a DNA point of view. But I think, Mark, the point is uh, important to make for pulmonologists and diagnosticians in general that fine needle aspirates are not enough mm -hmm. uh, for testing of all of the above that we just discussed. We'll come back to that because, you know, we now are in the era of immunotherapy and, um, you know, our testing in immunotherapy has been largely core biopsies. And so mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll come back and talk about this. If I could wake, make one minor comment before moving on. We talked a little bit about the exon 20 insertions uh, and failure of first generation TKIs in that space. I think it's worth just briefly mentioning that there's preclinical data and a little bit of clinical data for the third generation inhibitors for some of those insertions. Uh, and so these are patients particularly important to refer to folks who will have access to those kind of trials.